Good afternoon. I'm Carol Chris, the Chancellor. Thank you for the opportunity to join and welcome you all to the Berkeley campus for what's always a wonderful event, the Tanner Lectures on Human Values. We're honored and humbled to be one of only nine universities from around the world that were selected to host this distinguished lecture series each year. If we're to be judged by the company we keep, we could do far worse than to be joined by Cambridge, Oxford, Harvard, Michigan, Princeton, Stanford, Yale, and Utah. This lecture series was founded in 1878 by the American scholar, industrialist, and philanthropist, Obert Clark Tanner, who was also a member of the Faculty of Philosophy at the University of Utah and an honorary fellow of the British Academy. It's somehow both sobering and comforting to realize that today, nearly a half century later, the impetus behind the establishment of this lecture series could not be more germane or more important. Tanner's goal in establishing the lectures through the Tanner Philanthropies was to promote the search for a better understanding of human behavior and human values, an objective that could not be more simple to describe or more challenging and complex to achieve. Tanner hoped and believed that the lectures would advance scholarly and scientific learning in the area of human values and thus contribute to the development and enlightenment of our intellectual and moral lives. A cursory re review of contemporary headlines and happenings confirms that Tanner's concerns and aspirations are as relevant today as they've been in the past. As a campus community, we share with Obert Clark Tanner, a profound interest in and dedication to using education, knowledge, and understanding to support and advance the greater good. We also share his capacious perspective that human values should be defined as capaciously as possible, making room for a broad diversity of perspectives and equally broad per participation in this exploration of ourselves, our society, and our culture. As a result, the Tanner Lectures may be chosen from any discipline, and the lectureships can and do transcend national, religious, and ideological divides and distinctions. The Tanner Lectures are chosen based not on their particular perspectives, but in recognition of their uncommon achievements and outstanding abilities in the field of human values. The very ethos underlying the process of selection thus conforms beautifully with the underlying values that launched this lecture series. The lectures from all nine universities are published in an annual volume. In addition, Oxford University Press publishes a series of books based on the Berkeley Tanner Lectures. The 13th 14, and 14th volumes of this series were published in 2021, and four additional titles are in preparation. Here at Berkeley, the Tanner Lecturer is appointed through a faculty committee, of which I'm honored to chair. I also have to share I've never been to a meeting. I congratulate my <laughs> colleagues, <laughs> Professor Jay Wallace, Hannah Ginsborg, Christopher Kutz, King, Kinch Hoekstra, Nico Kaladny, Kevis Goodman, Stefan Ludwig Hoffman, and Rebecca McLennan for their brilliant choice of this semester's lecturer, Rachel Barney. We're also indebted to the Tanner Lectures Board for making available the funds to bring Rachel Barney to campus for this important lecture here. So let me now call on my distinguished colleague, Professor Kinch Kokstra, to introduce Rachel Barney. Professor Hoekstra will also moderate the Q&A that follows. Many thanks, Professor, uh, Chancellor Christ. Um, and actually, I'd like to take the occasion to thank you personally for your support over these many years uh, for the Berkeley Tanner Lectures and for encouraging our committee to pursue our vision of the lectures as substantial intellectual occasions. Um, there's a, it's a packed room. Plato has that effect. Uh, if you uh, have a seat next to you, if you, there's an empty seat next to you, could you raise your hand and then uh, there's... Okay, there are a, couple, a few, just a few up front. If uh, people who are standing, if people who are standing can make their way, don't be shy. There are a few right up front. Anyone volunteering? There we go. All right. Okay. 
Um, before our program begins, I would like to draw your attention to some general rules for the Tanner events, and we hope that you'll honor them by allowing all audience members to fully engage with the program. Kindly allow our speakers and your fellow audience members to benefit from today's program without interruption. Please turn off cell phones. Uh, please refrain from blocking anyone's view with banners or signs. Please do not shout or engage in any action that disrupts the event or that prevents the speakers from being heard. And please note that this event is being live streamed and will be archived on the Berkeley website. Next, a quick uh, word about format. Uh, I'm going to provide very brief introductions because we have such a packed schedule today. Today, we will hear from Rachel Barney and the first two of her commentators, Adam Gopnik and Rachna Kamtakar. Tomorrow, at the same time, same place, Professor Barney will give her second lecture, and we will hear commentaries by Alexander Nehamas and Christine Korsgaard. Um, Christine Korsgaard is uh, uh, joining us by Zoom at the moment. She was suddenly, able to, suddenly unable to join us in person, and we'll be doing our best to Zoom her in for tomorrow's uh, event. And just a, a warning right up top that we, um, that tomorrow, and especially today, uh, there will be likely somewhat um, very constricted time for audience questions. The design of the Tanner Lectures it does allow you for ample question time and ample audience participation on the final day, beginning here on Friday at 410, when there will be further discussion with our speaker and all four commentators. So do bring your questions along on Friday if you don't have the occasion to ask them today or tomorrow. Okay. I'm uh, hugely delighted to introduce this year's Berkeley Tanner Lecture. Um, Rachel Barney is the Canada Research Chair in Ancient Philosophy at the University of Toronto, where she is Professor of Philosophy and what is still for the moment known there as classics. Her string of brilliant philosophical essays range over Gorgias, Plato, Aristotle, Simplicius, the Stoics, Cicero, and Kant. They include revelatory analyses of Socrates' engagements with immoralists, the doctrine of desiring the good in Plato, the mechanics of becoming bad according to Aristotle, and puzzles about normative measurement in the Philebus and in the Statesman. She has a hawk's eye for the moving detail and the fit of the pieces into the panorama. But Professor Barney has a rock solid fan base here in Berkeley, and most of you in the room do not need me to introduce you to her virtues. Uh, they are many. I'll just say that on, on the one hand, she has been a masterful practitioner of what I think of as the traditional Anglo-American analytical approach to the study of ancient philosophy, which followed on from the pioneer, pioneering work of figures like Gregory Vlastos and Gwil Owen. In its way, this led to a productive period of important contributions, but when professors Barney and Kamtakar and I went to graduate school in ancient philosophy around the same time, it was perhaps a period marked by a certain narrowness of approach, even a kind of desiccation. Like Rachna Kamtikar and Alexander Nehamas, she found a way to use her skills of textual and philosophical analysis to revivify the corpus rather than being content to dissect the cadaver. <laughs> she brings an animated and animating attention to these ancient texts, as you'll see, if you don't already know. She finds life in them. In this way, Professor Barney reminds me rather more of recent and current graduate students of philosophy insofar as they have a more capacious conception of the field and a healthy insistence on connecting it to what matters in life. Professor Barney does often revisit classic and already much discussed problems in Plato and other author authors, but she has a philosophical green thumb. Indeed, if at the heart of the idea of craft is the commitment to getting things right, a kind of focused and specialized intelligence that solves naughty problems with panache, then Professor Barney, through her practice, stakes a claim for interpretive philosophy, this history of philosophy-based philosophy, as itself a kind of craft, the sort of thing that allows for a master craftsperson. So without further preliminaries, let's just watch her work. Please welcome Rachel Barney. Thank you very much for being here. When I was nine years old, my rich aunt took the whole family on a trip to New York City. 
we stayed at the Waldorf Astoria Hotel. And one day, as we were walking down the corridor to the elevator, we passed a workman hanging wallpaper. My aunt was always very friendly with strangers, and she turned to him and said, ooh, do you mind if we watch? And he turned around and said to her, in the broadest of New York accents, lady, does DiMaggio mind if you watch? <laughs> I don't think I knew who Joe DiMaggio was at the time, but I did know what the wallpaper hanger was saying, and I think you do too. He was saying that he practiced a craft, that he was a master of that craft and was proud of it, and that we would therefore take pleasure in watching him, and that this would give him pleasure in return. He was saying that there was a kind of dignity to what he did, that he was a hero of the city even, equal in his way to the famous ones. Now I think the paper, right, I think the paper hanger was right to think all those things, and in these talks I'll be trying to explain why. I'm a specialist in ancient Greek philosophy, as you've heard, and so my starting point for thinking about craft is with Plato, Aristotle, and the Stoics. And I should apologize, when I speak of ancient philosophy in these talks, I'm going to be speaking about ancient Greek philosophy because that's what I know. There's actually an equally rich tradition of thought about craft in um, classical Chinese philosophy, and it converges in very interesting ways with some of the Greek stuff. So I hope we get a chance to talk about that on Friday. So the Greek philosophers were obsessed with craft in ancient Greek techne. It was their preferred model for trying to understand the virtue or excellence, the arete, of the good person, and likewise the art of politics possessed by the wise ruler, the politike techne. On the craft model, the virtuous person and the good ruler are taken to be like the shoemaker or the carpenter, exercising practical reason to act rightly and well. And the idea is to use these familiar crafts to get, to get a purchase on the larger, harder, aspirational one. That makes it sound like the model is all about epistemology, about what the carpenter and the good person both have to know. And most scholarly discussion has focused on that. But there's another dimension to craft, and that's the one that fascinates me. Craft is a norm-governed mode of action, expressing not just knowledge, but patterns of mattering and valuing, motivation and obligation. For complicated reasons, this side of craft has mostly fallen off the theoretical map, but I think it's a large part of what the ancient use of it was driven by, Plato's in particular. So in these talks, I'll be trying to sort out this normative and motivational dimension of craft. Today, I'll start by sketching what I take to be our everyday conception of what a craft is, then I'm going to wheel in Plato to explicate its normative side and argue for its importance. And that'll include saying something about why it's actually the normativity of craft, which, uh, as I understand it, makes it a good model for human virtue. And tomorrow, I'll turn to a basic question which all of this raises, the question of where crafts get their normativity from uh, and what kind of normative authority it is exactly. But first of all, I need to say what I mean by craft. I don't just mean the handicrafts, the artisanal making of objects as championed by John Ruskin and William Morris. Um, though that is not to uh, diss them, Morris is actually going to be very important in tomorrow's talk. But I'm simply using the term to translate the ancient Greek techne. I'll also occasionally use art, expertise, and skilled practice. Now the term techne does pick out the carpenter, weaver, metalworker, potter, and the like, but it was never limited to them. The techni also include the art of the farmer, navigator, acrobat, horse trainer, and bard, not to mention the doctor and the accountant. At the heart of the concept is the very simple and general idea of correct action, getting things right, solving the practical problem in a given situation. More fully, craft action is action which is reliably correct in some domain because it's informed by specialist knowledge, so the craftsperson knows things other people don't. So techne itself, craft as such, is a kind of knowledge, intelligence, rationality, wisdom, even Sophia, which enables problem solving in a specialized domain. And if we're going to think about craft today, we should add in all the modern skilled practices which fit that profile, rinsing off any flavor of artisanal nostalgia uh, attached to the term. We need to think about what's common to potter and coder, weaver and barista, carpenter and airplane pilot, not to mention uh, the examples in uh, the probably almost illegible uh, poem of Auden uh, that uh, you're looking at up there. Um, a cook mixing a sauce, a surgeon, a clerk, and then later on um, we get a general bacteriologist and prosecutor. So the idea is that there's this diverse family of expert practices. Sometimes I think of it as big craft as opposed to little craft, meaning the handicrafts. Uh, and I think this is familiar enough uh, in an everyday way, even if it's not discussed in contemporary philosophy, this is actually a concept we all have access to. 
There are a couple of ways in which my version of Big Craft is going to be especially big. First of all, I'm going to include professional sports. That's partly in tribute to the paper hanger, who saw himself as Joe DiMaggio, uh, but it's also true that the ancient craft model makes heavy use of the archer, the runner, and other athletes. Sports are weird crafts in various ways I can't get into here, but it would be hard to deny that Lionel Messi and Roger Federer are using problem-solving intelligence to do things other people can't. Since my top here is going to be the normativity of craft, and since this tends to be much more clear-cut in the professional case, I'm limiting this inclusion in technique to professional athletes. And more generally, today and tomorrow, I'm going to be talking about craft done as work. So think of it as a single word, a single concept, craft as work. In German, you could probably do that, but um, just do it mentally. <laughs> I'm uneasily aware that this uh, leaves open some tricky questions, actually, about how the professional version of a craft is related to the amateur one, which has the same name. There are similarities and also important differences. Second, in big craft, I'm going to be including the arts, especially the so-called fine arts, such as painting and drawing, which are also canonical technai for the Greeks. I don't mean to claim that the arts are crafts exactly, though the history by which the visual arts and the handicrafts have come apart in the Western tradition is uh, recent and contingent looking. My claim is only that there's a lot of art subsumed into, a lot of craft, excuse me, subsumed into each of the arts, so that the practice of art often is an exercise in crafty problem solving. This seems especially clear in the case of drawing and painting, perhaps because of their constant confrontation with a visual reality that the artist is attempting to capture, except, of course, in the case of totally abstract art. So I'm here looking past the romantic stereotype of the artist uh, to think about an older paradigm of the artist as indeed uh, crafty, resourceful, cunning, competitive, professional. As Hesiod says at the start of the works and days, potter hates potter, carpenters compete, Beggar strives with beggar and bard with bard. So that's the ancient um, perspective. When T.S. Eliot dedicated the wasteland to Ezra Pound, he did so using a graceful phrase from Dante's Italian, il miglior fabro, the better maker, and fabro literally means blacksmith. In doing so, he wasn't just praising and thanking Pound, but telling us something about how to read his own work. By presenting the wasteland, of all things, as a work of craft, Eliot laid claim to a tradition and a powerful authority, like the conductor picking up his baton or the airline pilot putting on her hat. So craft is a very big tent. Some technai produce discrete objects, but others don't. Some wrangle with physical materials, others are more abstract. Some technai are obviously open to creativity and innovation. They avoid scope for inventing new problems and redefining old ones. But I wouldn't want to exclude crafts which are traditionally defined, like the regional koge of Japan, or ones which are too rule-bound to be very creative or individual. And I suppose the limit case there would be uh, accounting, uh, log is moss. In Toronto, there used to be a sign that fascinated me for a small business called unique bookkeeping. And I always wondered how these people had managed to make a, a creative art of it, but it disappeared. Um, so I never could find out what was, what was unique about it. So I think we recognize big craft when we see it, as Auden is prompting us to do with his examples, and I also think we care about it a great deal. Indeed, it seems to me that these days we're worried about it. So in the, the longer version of the talk, uh, there's a discussion of what I term craft angst, um, which is our fear that all the crafts around us are, are under threat and in danger of disappearing, and also uh, craft neurosis, which is uh, the sort of self-doubting fear you have that comes next, that maybe your concern for these crafts is uh, a matter of nostalgia or it's just valuing status goods, there's something classist about it, various unworthy motives that we um, worry are contaminating our angst. So I hope we can talk about this kind of thing on Friday because I haven't um, really found a, a way to work it in today. But one place to see how much we care about craft, I think, is in our culture's obsession with restaurants and cooking, particularly on display in what seems like uh, a literally infinite number of reality TV shows and documentaries. So when I, for the past couple of years, I've been going around asking everyone I uh, know, what can you recommend to me about craft and looking for philosophical texts or great novels. And, and usually I get cooking shows uh, recommended to me. And I'd suggest that this isn't just because we all love to eat. It's because food preparation is that rare thing, a great craft which is highly legible, epistemically accessible and intelligible to the outside uh, observer. What's more, in most of our neighborhoods, the restaurant is the last outpost left standing of craft. 
This is a point made by Adam Gopnik in his book, The Table Comes First. He says, the, reality of the, the value of the reality TV cooking show is that it, quote, celebrates in however debased and diminished a form an idea of expertise, of craft. I think he's talking about a particularly bad show there. I forget which one, but yeah. Um, and what made Anthony Bourdain, I think, a very special figure to many people is that he appreciated this and took on the role, actually, of chief, chief TV celebrant of craft um, in a quite general way worldwide, like a kind of public-spirited Dionysus. <laughs> the first spark for these talks, in fact, came years ago when I found an epigraph for a paper I'd been writing on Aristotle in one of Bourdain's books. Bourdain says, practicing your craft in expert fashion is noble, honorable, and satisfying. That's the voice of the paper hanger again, but it also translates pretty easily into ancient Greek. It was what jolted me into seeing that ancient philosophy and contemporary reality had something to say to each other on this topic, something which wasn't being said, as far as I could tell, by the contemporary philosophers. I'd suggest that what's true of cooking is also true of professional sports. Sports are extremely, as I think of it, vertical crafts. That's to say they give scope not just for doing things correctly, but for excellence, for greatness, for ever higher reaches, ever higher reaches of uh, what seem like superhuman performance. And yet, like cooking, and unlike, say, brain surgery or forensic accounting, they remain totally legible to the outside observer, so that watching great performance can give enormous pleasure. It seems to me reasonable to suppose that this is one of the things professional sports are for as a social institution. They're machines for making visible the beauty of craft as such. I'm going to use the term elegance for that particular form of beauty, the beauty of a difficult problem expertly solved. Sometimes elegance coincides with a physically graceful motion or it's expressed in a lovely product, but often it doesn't. So the places where it does, where it's literally visible, take on a special value for us. And this suggests to me that the handicrafts too are important to us in part by a kind of metonymy. Something like the hand and the eye working together to do something beautiful are present in all of the crafts. Watching the literal hand and eye of the athlete or the potter or the sushi master is important to us because it makes that vivid. And the pleasure of it can prime us to seek out and detect the same pattern and experience the same pleasure elsewhere in the harder cases, perhaps even in the doing of our own work like the paper hanger who watches Joe DiMaggio. In sum, I think big craft is something we recognize and care about. We may not think about it much, but we react to it, and we think with it all the time, just as the ancient philosophers did. That thinking might go better if we thought more explicitly about what it is, and that's what I'm going to try to do now. Not in the spirit of a quest for an essentialist definition, that's not a side of Plato I'm inspired by here today, um, but more for a sort of field guide, a checklist, a rough sketch, uh, to which more controversial points can be added later on. So here goes. Here's my little um, sketch of what uh, I think craft um, consists in. Provisionally, and I'm skipping a little kind of boring arc of, of argument here, um, I'd say that a craft is a system of skills meeting some threshold of demandingness or difficulty, with a certain coherence or unity to its techniques and to its products or results. The system of skills is ambiguous, however. By a skill, we might mean a type of action, as when I say catching a ball is a skill. But we also use skill to mean the cause of that action, what's in the agent's head, the disposition that enables them to do it reliably. If we focus on that, we can end up with a purely epistemic conception of craft, on which the word just denotes a type of knowledge. I'm going to take a more uh, holistic stance and discuss craft as a social kind, a complex pattern of thought and behavior on the part of multiple actors uh, interacting in a society. The expert knowledge is only a part of that pattern, albeit a central one. So ground zero for that social pattern that makes up craft is, as I've said, with the idea of correct action, uh, action which is reliably correct and therefore successful insofar as luck and circumstance allows because it's informed by specialized knowledge. Craft actions come in characteristic types um, they're not sort of uh, unique and unclassifiable. They're steering the ship, kneading the bread, shooting the arrow. And in addition to performing them, the expert can assess them and make relevant predictions about them and teach others to do them too. The expert performer is herself a replicable type, picked out by the craft generic, so generic terms like the navigator, the baker, um, the baseball player. The pattern formed around these actions and agents makes a three-way shape in a society. One part of that shape is intergenerational, 
The expert learns from the previous generation and teaches the next. The second part is that at any given time, the expert is part of a recognized social unit, a formal or informal guild whose members have a competitive relation to each other, but also a common identity, and if they're lucky, fraternal solidarity. Then there's also often an institutional vehicle by which uh, the collective practices of the craft are preserved and sustained. The hospital, the theater company, uh, the corporation. And third, the expert is also linked to the outsider, the layperson and customer, the beneficiary of their craft in a different way, by an economic filament of exchange and reciprocal benefit. In Republic Book Two, when Plato tells the story of the first city, he presents this network of reciprocal benefit as the starting point for human community as such. This is what a city for Plato most essentially is, this network of interdependent uh, craft practices. That presupposes, of course, that what the craftsperson does has value in the eyes of other people. And I'm going to speak of this value in terms of a craft being beneficial or worthwhile, or, though this begs a lot of questions, contributing to the common good. As I've said, at the center of this pattern is the expert's knowledge, um, but I'm going to say as little about that as possible. This is going to seem like cheating to all the philosophers in the audience because this is the only bit ph contemporary philosophy cares about, and I'm going to walk right by it as, as quickly as possible. But I will say a few things. Um, on the face of it, uh, the expertise involved in craft involves several complementary kinds of cognitive capacity. The doctor, for instance, needs a clear and systematic grasp of the relevant objects and causal relations which medicine deals with, the parts of the body, types of disease, effects of treatment, and so forth. Call that the episteme. For Plato, this is the most important part of any techne, and he insists that the doctor must be able to express it verbally by giving logoi accounts, which include both definitions and explanations of why some action is the medically correct one. Second, the skilled practitioner needs a heightened perceptual sensitivity or recognitional capacity. The doctor needs to perceive the symptoms and perceive them as symptoms of the disease. And third, every craftsperson needs what Gilbert Ryle called know-how, including mastery of any physical techniques and a general background sense of how to go about things, how to apply whatever rules the craft provides. These three capacities seem, to me at least, quite distinct, and a mark of that is that they're learned in different ways. You can get systematic knowledge from formal instruction or even from a book, but it's experience which heightens your perceptual discrimination and it's practice which enables you to apply them both in action. So apprenticeship in a craft naturally tends to have a three-step rhythm. The apprentice listens to the master's explanation, watches them perform the act correctly, and then imitates doing the same themselves. Now what the philosophers uh, argue about is which of these three elements of craft knowledge is the most important and which is best able to subsume or explain uh, the others. For Platonists and intellectualists, uh, this is the episteme. For Taoists, anti-intellectualists, Rileyans, it's the sensitivity or the know-how or some combination of the two. And I'm skeptical that either side will ever win this argument, and that's why I'm going to skip it over. And I have, I have arguments against the argument, uh, if anyone wants to uh, ask me about that um, on Friday or, or during the questions. Um, but for our purposes, it'll be important to keep all three parts sort of equally in view without um, attempting to simplify. So a craft is in good working order when all these parts of the pattern, that's to say the, the social pattern in its entirety, cohere in a self-sustaining system. When they falter, when the practitioners can't find customers or the students quit, or the institutions meant to preserve the craft start to degrade it instead, then we have a craft in trouble, an appropriate object of craft angst. When the practitioners don't really have knowledge in the first place, or they can't act correctly, or their work provides no real benefit anyway, then we have something worse, a pseudo-craft. And I would say that we also have a pseudo-craft when, um, although the craft does provide some benefit uh, and the craft um, people do have some knowledge, uh, what they provide isn't what they purport to. If there's a mismatch between, of some kind between knowledge and action and benefit, uh, I think that counts as a pseudo-craft also, because we think of crafts as being transparent. Um, that's part of my sort of social account, is that uh, a craft is the creation of a whole society um, participating in different ways, um, and the social understanding of that um, should match uh, what is actually taking place. One of Plato's great concerns is to sort out 
uh, pseudocrats and delegitimize them. The one he worries about the most is rhetoric, the art of persuasive speech before crowds. That's the evil twin of a real art, the art of politics. So which craft-like practices really are crafts um, is, I think, um, also one of the things that we care about. And it's a question about which a society can be deeply divided. So that's a deliberately cryptic comment that you might want to pursue during question period or, or on Friday. Um, uh, I think the, the concept of a pseudocraft is part of the reason we have the concept of a craft. Um, it's uh, one that can do a lot of work politically and in ethics, but I can't do it right now. In addition to pseudocrafts, we need to demarcate craft from all the recognized activities which aren't crafts and don't uh, pretend to be. So this is sort of a confirmation of uh, the account I've just given by looking at um, what the drawing teachers call the negative space, um, the stuff that's being separated off. Drawing the line between what's craft and what isn't can be tricky for a number of reasons, but for what it's worth, here's my list. Things which aren't and shouldn't be craft include friendship, family, the cultivation of loving relations of all kinds, low skill practices like getting dressed and taking the subway. I think that one's gonna be controversial. Um, yeah, we have a New Yorker here. So. Um, basic self-maintenance, grooming, exercise, and eating. Uh, play, amusement, creative activity done just for fun. Religious practice as such. Knowledge acquisition with no end or action in view, so just being a buff or a savant. Drudgery, paid or unpaid. Um, what David Graeber calls bullshit jobs, to use a technical term. Uh, making money just as such, what Plato calls wage earning. So some of these are uncraft-like by being inherently personal and idiosyncratic, so that impersonal standards of correctness seem misplaced. Others don't seem to involve skill in the right way, or don't involve action at all, or they fail to have the right kind of goal or end. There's room for debate here, of course, but I can't imagine such debates threatening the principle that a line can be drawn. So big craft is a big tent, but I'm claiming it's not so amorphous uh, to be a useless concept. It's not the case that everything ends up inside. Lots of things are very clearly out, and not necessarily any the worse for that. I think we also care about this line drawing, in fact, and that can be seen from a strange locution. We can speak of treating some activity as a craft or making a craft out of it. Uh, and the phrasing actually seems a bit more natural with art, so I'm going to switch to um, using art for techne for the moment. I don't here mean the way in which someone might say that Hippocrates first made an art out of medicine, meaning that was not an art before him, but it genuinely became one with him. I mean rather the way in which you might say that a colleague of yours has made an art out of sending maximally annoying emails, say. <laughs> Here, the locution implies that this practice is not apt uh, for the category of art or craft, uh, and it stays that way. It doesn't become an art um, because of your colleague's dedication. There are other terms that work the same way, such as game and religion. Call these categories of practice. You can't make a game out of checkers, and you can't make a religion out of Islam. But your colleague could make a game out of those annoying emails, or indeed, terrifyingly, they could make a religion out of them. To make a game out of something is, I suppose, to treat it as rule-governed, competitive, and set apart from the rest of life. To make a religion out of something is to treat it as a way of life demanding spiritual commitment. So what is it then to make an art or a craft out of something? I think if we said that, we'd mean that the person had taken up that activity in a serious way, more serious than a game, less serious than a religion, and made it the, ob made it the object of sustained effort, cultivating their skill at it with the intensity appropriate to a difficult but attainable and worthwhile goal. The real crafts, then, are the practices which are apt for being taken up in that spirit. They're the ones which belong in the craft-shaped box created by those attitudes. So far, I've just been trying to elucidate what I take to be built into our everyday conception of big craft. And if all this is on the right track, then that everyday conception is actually a remarkably rich one. I now want to turn to what Plato has to add to it. But to be clear, I think that Plato, um, uh, Plato too is trying to articulate uh, what he takes to be a conception of techne, to which we're all really uh, implicitly committed already. So Plato here, this may not be your image of him, but Plato here is on the side of the everyday um, and uh, attempting to articulate um, ideas about techne, which he thinks even his avowed opponents um, can be shown to be 
um, committed to uh, deep down. Um, so I see this as a sort of second stage in articulating um, the understanding of techne that we're all actually working with. But of course, it's going to get more controversial, uh, that claim from here on in. And it's going to have important philosophical implications, uh, which uh, Plato is proposing, and I'm agreeing, that we should uh, reflexive, reflectively uh, endorse once they're made explicit. Okay, so the point that I want to use Plato to explore is one which I've already mentioned in passing, because it's hard to talk about craft at all without doing so, but not yet explained or defended. This is that craft has a goal or purpose. It's end-oriented or teleological, so from the Greek telos, um, an end. To take Plato's favorite paradigm, the end of medicine is the health of the patient. And that's not altered if um, the medical practitioner uh, wants a summer home and is practicing medicine in order um, to obtain one. Um, it is not up to the will of the individual practitioner what the end of the art of medicine is. In fact, the real end of any craft is always a disinterested good. So the, the subtext, the hidden agenda of this talk is um, to reaffirm the value of the term disinterested as meaning not uninterested, but uh, impartial, um, impersonally oriented. That's to say, uh, the benefit of the practice of a craft is to society, not to the craftsperson herself. Cases of self-benefit are possible, as when the doctor heals herself or the chef eats in his own restaurant. But this just shows that the workings of craft are, so to speak, impersonal. There's always a beneficiary, but there's no correlation between the identity of the beneficiary and the identity of the practitioner, not even a negative one. The craftsperson is a demiurgos, literally a worker for the public, the demos. Plato has arguments for this conception of craft as teleological and disinterested, and I'm going to start by working through the alternatives he rejects and then explain and defend the platonic position. To start us off, here's a very simple alternative conception of craft. Call it the naive or the acephalous conception. And we at last come to our first real slide, very exciting moment. Um, I have a feeling that none of my... I finally figured out how to use slides which, uh, without them being too distracting, which is, first of all, have almost none of them, and then make them less than legible. So I'm not too uh, sure what's going to happen here, but... Yeah. I'm going gonna, I'm, I'm gonna to quote you the important bit, so um, don't, don't worry too much. Um, this is uh, just, <laughs> this is just, if we want to come back, once R Rachel and I start arguing, we can point to little, little points of detail. Um, so this is the excellent uh, translation by Alexander Nehamas and the late Paul Woodruff uh, in the Hackett edition of uh, Plato's Phaedrus. And this is um, Socrates uh, discussing, um, well, to be honest, really just making fun of a rival conception of craft, which I'm calling the acephalous conception. So Socrates says, suppose someone came to your friend Eryximachus or his father Acumenus. These are famous doctors of the era. Suppose someone came to your friend Eryximachus and said, I know treatments to raise or lower, whichever I prefer, the temperature of people's bodies. If I decide to, I can make them vomit or make their bowels move and all sorts of things. On the basis of this knowledge, I claim to be a physician and I claim to be able to make others physicians as well by imparting it to them. What do you think they would say when they heard that? What could they say? They would ask him if he also knew to whom he should give such treatments, when, and to what extent. What if he applied, oh, I have no idea. My claim is that whoever learns from me will manage to do what you ask on his own. And uh, in response, I think they'll say the man's mad if he thinks he's a doctor just because he read a book or happened to come across a few potions. He knows nothing of the art. So the naive doctor, doctor in scare quotes here, thinks that he practices medicine because he thinks it consists in a repertoire of techniques, a bag of tricks, and all of them are things he knows how to do. But obviously a doctor isn't just someone who can make people vomit at will. He has to know when and how and why to do it. And the real art of medicine is precisely what tells him that. It does so by tracing a chain of causes and effects from the problem situation, the disease, to the craft action to be performed, the remedy, and from there to the re result, health. Without that end in view, you won't pass the most basic test for techne, which is correctness and success in action. The conception of medicine as a mere repertoire of techniques is acephalous, headless, because it's missing the part which gives direction to the others. 
There's another argument Plato could make here. What makes the techniques known by the acephalous doctor all belong to the same art, the art of medicine? Admittedly, they all affect the body, making people vomit or changing their temperature, etc. But then so does tattooing, so does hairstyling. Those don't seem to belong to the medical art. No purely material conception is going to be able to capture what all and only medical procedures have in common. And so the acephalous conception of medicine isn't even independently coherent. It's only intelligible as parasitic, a truncated version of a conception on which all these techniques are united by being oriented to health. So the acephalous conception won't do. A more serious contender is the bivalent conception, which Aristotle opts for at least part of the time. You'll be glad to know I don't have a, a slide for that. Uh, so the bivalent conception is associated with Aristotle, but I want to make it clear that um, I'm going to give a sketch of it, which is not meant to capture his um, own position, which is complex and subtle, and I have to say I think not the same uh, in every text. Um, so I'm not attempting to give his version of it here. So Team Aristotle can stand down. I'm not um, <laughs> taking him in, in view. On the bivalent view, a craft is a unity organized around producing either of a pair of opposite states. The main argument for the bivalent conception is what I'll call the poisoner problem. This is the fact, all too well known in antiquity, that a skilled doctor can also act as the most expert poisoner. This sad truth might seem to suggest that medical expertise as such is neutral between the two opposite properties of health and sickness, or death, which it is equally able to produce. Which to choose is a question which stands outside the craft itself, to be determined by the preference of the doctor on each occasion. Now the poisoner problem represents the obvious objection, and it's often seen as a decisive one, to using craft as a model for human virtue. For we think that virtuous dispositions motivate in a very special way, namely overridingly. The just person, for instance, is one who always will opt to do the just thing, no matter the, the pressures in the other direction. So if the doctor as such can choose either of two opposite actions, then there seems to be a profound motivational disanalogy between virtue and craft. And you might indeed think that's one of um, the sort of key hallmarks of virtue, that motivational specialness. Now, it isn't my primary purpose here to defend the craft model, but I do think that objection is misguided in that it misses something about how Plato's conception of craft is supposed to work. To see why, we need to turn to Republic I, which is in any case the crucial text for my purposes today. What Republic I has to say about craft is endlessly rich, and I'm going to be very uh, selective and ruthless in discussing it. The first key moment for us comes in Socrates' discussion with Polemarchus. Socrates is arguing against Polemarchus' cynical definition of justice as helping friends and harming enemies. His main strategic move has been to add in the assumption that justice is a craft. And by the way, Socrates is always doing this in the early dialogues. Um, you'll probably recall that he goes around talking about shoemakers and carpenters to the point where people get quite annoyed uh, with him for lowering the tone of debates about virtue. Um, but they don't uh, ever raise the sorts of objections that modern philosophers do about craft and virtue being you know, different in kind motivationally or whatever. Um, they're just sort of annoyed in a classist way. Um, and I actually uh, take that as uh, significant evidence that the craft model, the idea of modeling human virtue and the political art on the recognized crafts, um, that's not unique or special to Socrates or to Plato. That is something that is absolutely entrenched in the intellectual atmosphere of the fourth and before that the fifth century. And uh, I think it's actually um, credit is due to the sophist Protagoras um, for getting it into circulation, uh, at which point it becomes actually something of a matter of, of consensus and a kind of common intellectual project. Um, so Polemarchus um, is uh, perfectly willing to entertain the thought that justice is a craft. And uh, the twist is that Socrates um, introduces the idea that it's specifically a bivalent craft. And through that, he's able to uh, introduce various uh, absurdities um, and refute Polemarchus' definition. Then in his final argument, um, so don't worry, uh, do my best here. <laughs> I do have a pointer somewhere. Um, anyway, 
in his final argument, um, Socrates uses an induction over the crafts to, uh, it's not the one I'm used to. Um, look, I'll tell you what it says. <laughs> Socrates is arguing against the bivalent conception of craft directly. So he's no longer uh, just arguing against Polemarchus. He's saying, look, uh, it can't be the work of the just person to do harm. And uh, he proceeds by means of an inductive survey over various crafts, focusing on the crafts as they are learned. So uh, his cases are um, horse training and dog training and uh, music and horsemanship. And the idea seems to be that if you focus on the learning of a craft, it becomes pretty clear that craft is not bivalent, but unidirectional. So musical teaching and learning makes the student musical, musicos. Horsemanship makes people good at riding horses. These are one-way competences to act successfully. Socrates then goes on to analogize them to causal natural powers, dunamis, like hotness or the hot, which has as its characteristic work, ergon, to heat. Now, that analogy with natural power seems odd. It can be debated. But it does bring out that most crafts don't have a determinate counter end, as we might call it, comparable to poisoning in the case of medicine. Uh, the opposite of singing in tune or riding a horse well is simply failing at those things. And the ways of failure are infinite and unknowably many. So to say that a craft enables you to produce either of two opposed states, as the bivalent conception does, just seems wrong. Now, the debate which follows between Socrates and Thrasymachus is one of the great uh, set-piece debates in all of ancient philosophy. I've discovered it, I, I've discussed it in uh, a number of um, papers and um, uh, not, I'm sure, sorted it out, but I am going to be very elliptical uh, here um, because it is uh, so rich. It's essentially an argument about the value of justice and the true nature of political expertise, and it's organized around conflicting conceptions of craft. For, unlike Polemarchus, Thrasymachus is not willing to agree that justice is a craft. On the contrary, he associates craft with the clever doing of injustice. His hero is the expert ruler who's a skilled expert in his exploitation of those he rules. The importance of craft for this ideal comes out when he retracts an earlier admission that his expert ruler can make mistakes. He says, You can, you can use this as an eye chart, right? You can, uh, has, has, many, has many uses. Um, actually, I think there's something called zoo. Is that a bit better? Yeah, that is, isn't it? OK. Um, he says, when someone makes an error in the treatment of patients, do you call him a doctor in regard to that very error? Or when someone makes an error in accounting, do you call him an accountant in regard to, or you might say based on, uh, kata, that very error in calculation? I think with, that we express ourselves in words that do say that the doctor is an error and the accountant and the grammarian. But I think that each of these, insofar as he is what we call them, never errs. So that, according to the precise account, since you too go in for precise accounts, no craftsman ever errs. This might look like a fussy metaphysical claim. Only the perfect possessor of a craft really counts as such. But really, the point is more general and more abstract, and it's one Plato himself uh, accepts. The doctor, according to the precise account, or insofar as he is a doctor, the doctor qua doctor, to use the phrase in which becomes standard, that's any doctor, insofar as he is acting as a doctor. That's to say, intelligently doing as the art of medicine commands. It's this specialized identity which is what really acts when a doctor heals a patient. Putting it more strictly still, what really acts is the art of medicine itself as embodied and operationalized by the human being who possesses it. On the basis of this bit of metaphysics, Thrasymachus argues that the expert ruler, the ruler qua ruler, acts to serve his own interest. What he's expert in is doing injustice to his subjects, and what's criterial for correct action is the outcome of self-benefit. Thrasymachus thus commits to what I'll call the self-interested or selfish conception of craft. So that phrasing is meant to recall the old-fashioned phrase, the selfish theory 
um, as used for early modern theories like Hobbes and Mandeville, and one can also apply it to um, theories of a sort of homo economicus form. And Thrasymachus is indeed, I think, the great granddaddy of all these um, theorists, even though he doesn't go so far as to say that um, unself-interested action is absolutely impossible. In the discussion which follows, Plato presents several lines of argument against the selfish conception of craft. I'm just going to discuss the first two, which he seems to view as decisive. Socrates' first argument is the argument from the doctor. This is at 341c, 42e. And unfortunately, from, from here on, the arguments get long enough that zooming in is just going to be a bit surreal. You'll get a few random um, phrases. But uh, yeah, that's already, well, so we'll come to that in a moment. The argumentation is complex, but its central point is just a reminder of what I've already noted. What's constitutive of medicine is the promotion of the health of the patient, and whether the doctor makes any money at it or otherwise serves his own interest is irrelevant. Thrasymachus needs to be argued into this, but in a way the game is up from the start, when he immediately grants that the doctor, strictly speaking, is to be identified not as the money maker, but as the person who cares from the sick. It's at 341c. Thrasymachus fights back, however, by introducing a counter paradigm to Socrates' doctor, the shepherd. Um, so here's a, a bit of their debate about uh, the art of shepherding. For that craft, Thrasymachus argues, surely aims to benefit the shepherd himself, not the doomed and unsuspecting sheep. This is a particularly strong blow given that the shepherd is a standard analog for the king in Greek thought, just as in the ancient Near East. So this is a craft whose pertinence to the case of the expert ruler is especially clear. But Socrates doesn't concede the counterexample. Instead, he introduces what I'll call the wage earning argument to disarm it. And that's what you're um, looking at there. Here, Socrates argues that it's precisely because the practice of craft as such doesn't benefit the practitioner that they generally have to be paid to do it. So the shepherd must be exercising two crafts at once, shepherding and wage earning. And insofar as he's acting as a shepherd, wearing the shepherd hat, his actions must be governed by the norms of that craft. This distinction between the two hats worn by the agent at once relieves any pressure to write self-interest into the craft of shepherding itself. It also brings out that, like the acephalous conception, the selfish conception has a problem with the individuation of crafts. The acephalous, conception, the acephalous conception assigned no end to any craft, and so it couldn't explain what holds a single craft together. The selfish conception assigns an end to every craft, but it's the same one every time, benefiting the agent. And so it can't really make any sense of the way that we take the crafts to be different from each other. Um, and it's just a basic fact about the crafts which Socrates um, emphasizes over and over that each uh, provides a distinctive benefit, an ophelia idea uh, of its own. Uh, and that, uh, that disappears on Thrasymachus' account. So even though Thrasymachus is sort of fascinated by craft and wants the craftsperson to be a model for his ruler, there's a weird way in which his theory is almost elim eliminativist about craft. They all sort of turn into mush uh, on his theory um, by having no uh, genuine distinguishing features. The wage earning argument also clarifies something important. The end of a craft is not identical with the motivation which stirs someone to practice it. It'll help us later and for next time if we distinguish three types of this uh, external motivation that the agent might have. There's the originating motive, which leads a person to take up the craft in the first place. The sustaining motive, which is their reason for staying with it. Sustaining motives are gonna be important. Um, next time we'll be asking what, what the normative forms of sustaining motives are. And third, there's the prompt, the situational trigger which causes someone to exercise their craft in a particular case. So someone might become a doctor in order to please their parents, remain one in order to pay their mortgage, and on any given day practice medicine in response to a range of prompts, which would range from mere routine to the desire to help an injured passerby. On the platonic conception, all such external motivations are non-explanatory. They're irrelevant to what it is to practice a craft as such. For within the practice of the craft, if it's not being done correctly, the practitioner is acting on the disinterested internal motivations provided by the end of the craft itself. 
I'll say more about this in the next section. These three anti-Platonic conceptions of craft, acephalous, bivalent, selfish, represent a shared intellectual impulse. And that's the impulse to see in craft a kind of pure and neutral instrumentality. The acephalous conception stresses that the naive doctor can do whichever thing he prefers. The bivalent one says that he can play doctor and poisoner equally well. Thrasymachus does grant that craft is unidirectional, but he holds that its direction is towards self-benefit so that it's naturally adapted to promote the end which he thinks all but the most idiotic of us are aiming at anyway. The three conceptions thus represent three different strategies for spelling out a concept of craft as a tool, a source of ethically neutral power wholly subordinated to the antecedent, presumptively selfish, desires of the agent. And they all fail because any such conception of craft is deeply at war with the everyday reality of the recognized crafts, which, in their unity and multiplicity, are teleological practices with ends of their own, independent of the self-interest of their practitioners. The failure of these three anti-Platonic conceptions matters, not only because it's important to get craft itself right, but because techne, for Plato and for the anti-Platonists alike, is just practical rationality itself in its most highly developed and best understood form. In their humble, localized way, the everyday techni, like sh carpentry and shoemaking, are what human reason looks like when it's brought as near as possible to perfection and exercised with reliable success. So it matters intensely to Socrates and Thrasymachus alike how the techni are structured, what their rationality consists in, what kind of good they pursue. And as I've said, it seems to me that this battle about the structure of techne is one which Plato decisively wins. From here on, I'm going to be taking his own teleological conception, which I take, as I say, to also be our own conception, more fully articulated. I'm going to be taking that as given and spelling out its implications and asking questions about where it leads philosophically. And I'm going to begin doing that uh, in the final section of the paper, uh, which is about um, the motivational component of techne on this teleological conception. Okay, we don't need the shepherd anymore. On the teleological conception, to practice a craft means adopting the internal deliberative standpoint which the craft provides and acting accordingly. And this requires what I'll call motivational insulation. In any given day at the workshop, we might find ourselves tempted to cut corners and laps from craft norms by motives as various as hunger, nepotism, a screaming boss, fear of rent day, or for that matter, the promptings of some irrelevant virtue. From the internal standpoint, all are equally noise. And the practitioner who insulates against them all, sticking stubbornly to the task at hand, has a virtue we might call integrity. This integrity is, I think, uh, what Richard Sennett is getting at in his influential book, The Craftsman. So I don't know how many of you are familiar with this book, but this is sort of the state of the art in terms of thinking about um, craft. Um, and it aspires to talk about big craft, but in practice, Sennett um, sort of lapses into focusing very heavily on the handicraft, so it's not as useful to me uh, as it might have been. But here's an interesting uh, line we're thinking about from it. He says... Craftsmanship names an enduring, basic human impulse, the desire to do a job well for its own sake. And there's something that sounds a bit right about that, but on the Platonic account, uh, the word impulse here is misleading. Craft is a hat we put on, a way of being motivated which we choose to undertake. The for its own sake is misleading too. Usually the craftsperson's most basic enduring human impulse is just to pay the rent. Senate's phrasing gives the impression that there's something defective about that, uh, that there's a contradiction here, or at least a paradox. Uh, but I think there isn't really. It's just that we have to properly distinguish the motivations internal to the craft used in practicing it uh, from the external ones which lead us towards it. Internally, then, craft does motivate, and it motivates the way any system of norms does by being internalized. This view of craft as involving internalized norms is, I believe, deep-seated and almost impossible to get away from. Even Thrasymachus says that the grammarian, strictly speaking, spells the word correctly, and that the logistikos, um, the accountant, gets the sum right. And yet these craft generics exclude the person who errs because of defective or rogue motivation just as much as they do the incompetent. 
The very idea of the role incorporates an understanding of what the person in that role is trying to do. The reason for this embedding of normativity into the role of craftsperson is easiest to see if we think about how crafts are learned. In many cases, I think it's hard or impossible to imagine how craft knowledge could be acquired without a concurrent apprenticeship in caring and valuing. As the apprentice watches and emulates, she has to learn what to care about and worry over, which actions to praise and blame, who to admire. She acquires a map of mattering, perceive this as a problem to be solved, that as the tool to be used, this is the thing to be done. Information becomes salient and gets added to her craft knowledge by being placed on that gerundive structured map. The bivalent conception, by contrast, implies the possibility of an education in horsemanship, which would be neutral between staying on and falling off. It lands us with a literally Pythonesque view of human agency, one on which one might become a fully expert cheese shop proprietor, for instance, while having no preference whatsoever for ever selling any cheese. For actual human beings, the acquisition of a craft isn't like that at all. Instead, it depends on engagement, ideally the kind of passionate engagement celebrated by Auden. And I, I commend the whole of that um, poem to you that we started with. If for Plato, craft does in this way include motivation, we might wonder, how can he account for the poisoner problem? And the answer is very simple. By allowing that the motivations given by craft are local and defeasible. They'd better be, since sometimes what craft prescribes is the wrong thing for the human being to do. Since the end of a craft is only some part of the human good, the perspective of craft is always partial. Sometimes the reason for action given by a craft is overridden by the perspective of a larger whole, whether morally or by the norms of another craft. The nephrologist's preferred tradition for the kidney disease may be ruled out by the blood pressure medicine prescribed by the cardiologist. The rational solution to the conflict will be the one which emerges from the broader standpoint of medicine as a whole. Plato and Aristotle both think that all the crafts fit together into a gigantic interdependent network of this kind. Um, they all have something to say to each other. They all need to be used to correct each other at some point. Its end is the human good writ large as realized in a political community. And the craft which puts the pieces together and does the adjudication and gives all things considered imperatives is the art of politics. And now we can see one reason why the crafts provide a useful model for thinking about human virtue. Like the other ancient Greek ethical thinkers, Plato takes it, plausibly enough in my view, that our starting point for ethical reflection is self-centered and eudaimonistic. We're trying to discover how we should live in order to be happy, eudaimon. Scholars have long worried about whether this eudaimonistic starting point implies something like the selfish theory in the end, and so undermines the morality which the philosophers use it to promote. If my desire for happiness moves me to value friendship, and so to care about my friend's happiness as something independent of my own, well, doesn't even this turn out correctly seen to be something I want for my own sake in order to be happy? Or if the demands of virtue, say justice or courage, require me to sacrifice my life, well, correctly understood, won't that be true, ultimately for my own sake and therefore selfish if my motivations are seen in full, if we track it all the way back to that initial desire for eudaimonia? And if so, what value can really accrue to the moral virtues which the philosopher claims we need to practice in order to be happy? The reality of craft shows that this threatened regress is fallacious. For the everyday, the everyday crafts, are all the proof we need of the human capacity for taking on a genuinely new motivational standpoint, one discontinuous with whatever brought you into the room. Someone might become and happily remain a firefighter simply because firefighting is exciting. But while they're engaged in fighting fires, if they're practicing their craft correctly, they're going to be acting on the reasons for action which firefighting itself provides. And because it would be exciting, really isn't one of those. If we're watching a soccer game, and um, a particular player runs back to the goal, and you ask me why that is, I can say, well, it's because Carolyn is the goalie. If I were to say instead, well, about a year ago, Carolyn decided she needed more exercise, and her friends were on the team, and I gave you the full recital of all the actions that had led Carolyn up to that particular moment, um, that would be a worse explanation, not a fuller and better one. 
The external motivations which led Carolyn to take up being a goalie are irrelevant to her reasons for action as a goalie, at least if she really is acting as a goalie, if she's not compromised in her performance by her friendships or vices or personal tastes. Now, to be a virtuous person for Plato is to take on a very special craft. It's one which allows no time off and which is subordinated to no other higher perspective. That's why it has to be, in a sense, identical with the art of politics. It's a hat you have to wear all the time. But the same structure of motivational discontinuity and insulation applies. And this means that when the virtuous person does what friendship or courage requires, they're not acting selfishly any more than the skilled firefighter who chooses the right procedure can be correctly described as just seeking excitement. Tomorrow, I'm going to look at the norms of craft from another angle, asking exactly what makes them binding on the practitioner. Why should a shoemaker care about making good shoes? If I'm a shoemaker, what makes, its demands, what makes the demands of shoemaking binding for me? We'll begin with this small looking shoemaker's question and end up, I hope, in utopia. So I hope to see you then. Because Professor Barney landed that just a little bit early, uh, and because uh, this is the proceedings are fairly long, I think we can take uh, five to seven minutes uh, to move around, stretch, um, but only about that much time, five to seven minutes. That way we'll uh, have uh, plenty of time for both of our commentators and a few questions at the end. Thanks. OK, and um, it does look like there are a few seats that have opened up. If there's a seat without anything on it, it's fair game. Uh, that's a new rule. Um, and uh, all right, let's let's uh, start back up. I, there are a couple of seats over here. All right. If anyone's in the bathroom, I'm sorry uh, to have gotten your seat away. All right. Very good. Let's uh, recommence. So, to a cultivated crowd like this one. The question is not who Adam Gopnik is, but what are your Gopnikian favorites? Like a preferred one of the Goldberg variations, or Godfather movies, or Led Zeppelin albums, people have a particular passion for one or more of his works. His Paris to the Moon of 2000, when m many of us first heard of him, his children's novels, his fantastic essays about his children, his best-selling 2009 book about Lincoln, Darwin, and modern life, his stirring defense of liberalism, A Thousand Small Sanities of 2019, or one of his many other extraordinarily thoughtful and elegant meditations. Per perhaps because of the feeling of familiarity one has about someone, who is, uh, someone one has repeatedly read, it is hard to believe the sheer span of Adam Gopnik's intellectual wings from tip to tip, that he is an accomplished writer of librettos, for example, or just how dizzying is the range of the topics of his reliably penetrating essays. As a marker of his status as a geist of the zeit, think of Marshall McLuhan in the 1977 film Annie Hall. He recently played himself in a major Hollywood film, the opening scene of Tar being Adam Gopnik playing Adam Gopnik, interviewing Kate Blanchett's title character. So although locally he's known as the brother of Berkeley's Alison Gopnik, that is not always and everywhere his first claim to fame. <laughs> Perhaps most relevantly for the theme of these lectures, Adam Gopnik recently undertook and reflected uh, satisfyingly deeply on a series of pursuits that did not always lead to total mastery, including painting, dancing, driving, and boxing, for his wonderful observations and ruminations published in book form last year as The Real Work on the Mystery of mastery. Please join me in welcoming Adam Gopnik. Thank you. Thank you for that lovely introduction. I've been known as Allison's younger brother since I was uh, one year old, and I will doubtless continue to be known as such. Um, 
Uh, Rachel, I just wanted to thank you for that. Um, the word provocative and stimulating are generally academic euphemisms, uh, but I mean them quite sincerely, that your, this lecture was both provocative and stimulating, even more in spoken form, which set off a whole new train of thought for me than it was as I read it. The, um, the uh, reality cooking show, by the way, which you referenced, is, if I'm right, was the American version, the one that I was ripping, was the American version of the Iron Chef, which was I, com I was comparing to the Japanese version of Iron Chef. Gentlemen here, because the Japanese version of Iron Chef is a genuine celebration of craft disciplined by criticism, because when they submit their dishes at the end, they have to listen intently to what the panel of judges is saying, and they nod politely. The American version of Iron Chef is a celebration of egotism. They don't listen to what the, what the critics are saying, and they're meant to, um, and the real life of it is, when they confide in the announcer afterwards how foolish and, the, and unappreciative the critics are. I think thereby hangs many a story. Um, I also think uh, that the um, relation, I turned that uh, consideration about uh, craft and art and cooking actually into a musical comedy called Our Table, which you can find on Spotify in the original craft uh, version of it. And uh, as I was doing that and reflecting on this questions of craft and art, uh, I was also simultaneously uh, writing a very uh, arty, I was writing a craftsman-like musical with the great David Shire and a very arty oratorio with um, the avant-garde composer Nico Muley. And one of the things I, where my reflections on craft and art perhaps begin is that when David Shire and I were making a crafty piece of, mu of commercial musical theater, all we asked each other was, is this clear, is it lucid, will the audience get it? And when Nico and I were making a work of avant-garde oratorio, all that Nico ever said to me, I said, is this clear? Will the audience get it? He said, they'll read it in the program. And <laughs> I realized then that one of the distinctions made um, spontaneously in our culture is exactly that um, uh, enter the craft of entertainment is a place where you're expected uh, to explain everything to the audience. And the um, business of art is a place in which, in fact, um, the audience is expected to understand everything for you, right? The total their reversals of those two things. Um, it also strikes me that though I've been writing about um, uh, craft in the, the real work, the book I did, uh, empirically studying what Rachel has uh, uh, captured so categorically, which is, after all, I suppose, the craft of philosophy, exactly is to take our own um, accidental empirical observations and give them system and, and form. Uh, I was also writing in a book called um, At the Stranger's Gate, I was writing about the kind of surprisingly transitive and reversal-like relationship of craft and art in Soho in New York in the 1980s, because one of the things that always fascinated me was that at the very moment when craft was being denigrated in art by the practice of conceptual art and of uh, no, deliberately non-original neo-geo art, the crafts of cooking and carpentry, for instance, were simultaneously being elevated. So I remember so well going to dinner with an artist who had made a major reputation simply for photographing other works of art and then signing them as her own. We went to dinner at a, a Soho restaurant. She said, I love this place because uh, the chef here cooks like nobody else on earth. So we fi simultaneously had <laughs> the denigration of originality in the things we counted as art and the elevation of originality in what was previously counted only as craft. And that leads me to my general and my um, uh, kind of overriding reflection on, uh, on this lecture and the ideas that it calls to mind. And that is that the relation, it seems to me, of craft and art um, and when we discuss it, is almost always fascinatingly dynamic. And the things that we call craft on one day become art in the next day, and the things that we call art quickly become craft. And we're always constantly calculating, taking part in that kind of, uh, as I say, dynamic and unpredictable relationship between the two. And secondly, though I never thought um, tar would play an important part in today's conversation, there's also, it seems to me, that if there's one other dimension we could add to uh, our, the question of craft and what it is, it's exactly the element of social performance. 
um, in the movie Tar. I don't play Adam Gopnik. I play a version of Adam Gopnik who I inhabit on occasions like this one, who's a much more interesting person than I actually am and more empathetic with the people he's questioning than I really ever can be. Um, and there's an element of social performance in it. I couldn't help but think about it, Rachel, as you were talking about um, the platonic investigation of the doctor and the use of the doctor and the craft of the doctor as a, as a model of what craft is and could be. Because, of course, the first thing that occurs to us is that the last thing in the world you would want to do if you were sick in ancient Athens is go to a doctor, right? Because it's exactly the point that the, no the actual knowledge of the doctor, the actual craft of the doctor, in the pre-scientific era was very limited. It's one of the things that always happens if we're reading 18th century fiction or 17th century French fiction and some 17th century French biography and someone goes to a doctor. You know that they're in trouble. You know they won't survive the chapter or the year that they're, they're going to. And yet, and this is the fascinating thing, it's clearly true in Plato and it was true right throughout, that never resulted in the denigration of the craft of the doctor. There was a complicated profession of being a doctor. It was a celebrated craft of being a doctor, even though, in retrospect, it was simply a form of social performance that had the most tangential relationship to the business of doctoring, of actually getting people better, since they generally got people worse um, rather than better. And as a consequence, I think the key um, uh, statement and concept which I uh, respond to as the, as the author of the real work is that we feel instinctively that craft is, uh, involves some kind of skill, some kind of nameable skill that sets, apart, sets it apart from all the other kinds of things that we do. And exactly as you say, it's one of the reasons why we always feel that there's a special integrity in craft, because we understand that even if someone is a rotten person in a million other ways, in their role as qua craftsmen, to use your phrase, we understand that they have, they must have integrity because they have to rise to the level of a, a set of skills that were, in some sense, determined in advance. Um, uh, I'm fascinated by the DiMaggio story, as I said, because one of the things, again, uh, what philosophers uh, understand conceptually, uh, we uh, uh, writers uh, can practice empirically. One of the things I discovered when I started the business of being a reporter, I was trained as a graduate student, and I had to beat the graduate student out of myself. As Chekhov says, he beat the surf out of himself. And one of the things you have to do when you're trying to beat the graduate student out of yourself is to learn what questions are profitable when you're out on the street doing reporting. And the one question exactly which Rachel has so beautifully uh, captured that always, always works. You can ask anybody in any field at any in any social circumstance, who's the Willie Mays of your profession, or the Michael Jordan, or the Wayne Gretzky? And you'd think that would be an opaque question, but it's invariably a question that inspires a vivid answer. You can ask a plumber, or you can ask a painter, who's the Wayne Gretzky of plumbing? And the plumber won't look at you blankly and say, I have no idea what you mean by that. Uh, he'll say, oh, Joe Panansky. Oh, Joe Panansky, you put a wrench in his hand, he can cut off the water to an entire city with one turn of his wrist. Everybody has a powerful, instinctive sense of what it is to be the DiMaggio of wallpaper hangers. And just to add, unless Rachel is far, far older um, than uh, she appears, when the paper hanger said that on that trip to New York, he was referring to a classic. He wasn't referring to, yes, exactly, to a living uh, ac uh, exemplar of that, but exactly to a classic, someone who he had grown up admiring. Um, and I think that that's a, an extraordinarily powerful clue to what we mean when we celebrate craft, is exactly that it's something on which, in a contentious world, there is surprising degree of agreement. George Plimpton, in one of his books about football, for instance, uh, notes that going to the um, all-pro game, the all-star game of the NFL in the 1960s, the players divided themselves into first team, second team, third team instantly and without dispute. Johnny Unitas, if anyone remembers him, was obviously the quarterback of the first team. Bart Starr, if you remember him, of the second team. Just as today, if you went to the All-Pro game, no one, no other quarterback is going to try and usurp the place of Patrick Mahomes. We all understand, respect, uncontroversially, what that standard of craft is. And yet, 
and forgive me if I race through these points in the, in the 10 minutes here, but as I said, this is a truly provocative thought, in the best sense, thought-provoking lecture. lecture. Um, if we think about the relationship of craft and art, craft being, in that, in that sense, the, the solid thing that we can all reference, and we know that Patrick Mahomes is better than uh, Brock Purdy, um, uh, but we recognize that. At the same time, I think we see that when we think about something like the visual arts, we see that what counts as a craft standard at one moment and what is an art standard at another moment is fascinatingly always um, in play. Uh, Rachel referenced, I think, the way in which um, craft and art have been separated in our visual culture over the past uh, 100 or 200 years. And yet what's so fascinating about that, I think, is exactly the way in which each thing is mutable. What do I mean by that? Well, we all tend to revere Henri Matisse, for example, as a master, as someone who is a great draftsman, who is an extraordinarily, not just a great artist, but an exquisite artist. And yet, as anybody knows who's done uh, art history, when Matisse began his characteristic drawing, it was universally seen as an assault on craft. It was universally seen as something that involved not continuing the craft of drawing, but deliberately breaking your hand, to use the French expression, in order to insult the normal craft of drawing. Now, of course, we recognize that we have to find ways to imitate Matisse's bad drawing in order to do our own good drawing. But exactly the advance in art came out of a kind of deliberate, preordained insult to craft. And that's something that is generally true about modern art again and again and again. It's a rejection of skill uh, in pursuit of anti-skill, which then in turn becomes a widely disseminated craft that, that uh, everyone or that any uh, acolyte uh, can participate in. So that again, that relationship of craft and art seems to me tellingly uh, dynamic, tellingly one in which what is today's craft is then broken and becomes tomorrow's incomprehensible art, which then in turn becomes the next day's uh, meaningful and definable craft so that we all can say of Matisse as of Patrick Mahomes, he's the best there is, even though his work begins in a kind of assault on uh, craft. Um, uh, the example of professional sports, which we only began to uh, uh, touch on now, is one that I also find uh, fascinating as somebody who is a, a complete addict of uh, pro sports and uh, can't get beyond them. Because there again, we turn to pro sports exactly for their craft, because they are as pure demonstrations of skill as anything that we have. And I think about what that uh, wonderful philosopher Nguyen has to say about that, that what sports do, right, is they take unworthy goals, meaningless goals, get to the end zone, score, put the goal in the net. And yet they display for us, they forward for us, foreground for us, um, the ways of getting there. So that's what we watch sports for, is exactly all of the means of agency, which we then absorb. Whereas in life, we pursue worthy goals, but we do it in completely disorganized ways, right? So we can't ever reference what we're doing as skilled in that sense. So sports give us a model of agency stripped free of meaning in a certain sense, or of meaningfulness of our trying to do that. I think that there, again, that same dynamic relationship of craft and art is very much, uh, is very much involved. Uh, so much so that my own great teacher, uh, Kirk Varnado, one of the uh, great art historians of his generation, now sadly gone, uh, wrote a whole book, uh, a meditation on the nature of modern art that was called A Fine Disregard that was based on thinking about the origins of the game of rugby, which as some of you may know, began when a player named Webb Ellis uh, playing a soccer game, picked up the soccer ball and ran with it. And the question always is, is, and that was the beginning of the rugby game at the rugby school, question always is, why didn't the referee simply blow the play dead and say, you can't do that? Instead, what's that? It's yes, but let's, but let's say for the moment. <laughs> right, all right. Let's say for the moment that, it, that it's enshrined as a myth exactly because it captures something very powerful about the nature of innovation. That is, that it can be a violation of the rules, which by so general social agreement suddenly becomes in itself the rule towards a new game. That is the, that's the vital uh, part of that story, and that's what 
that's why it maps so well onto the history of modern art, which is a constant series of violations of the rules, which then become new rules, constant series of violations through art of craft, which then inspire new crafts um, themselves. Uh, finally, let me just uh, add one last thought to this, and there's a whole other thing which I hope we'll be able to uh, talk about later about the role of audience in craft. As I said, so much of craft seems to me is a kind of social performance, like the, um, uh, like the medieval or the antique doctor whose role as a doctor is a social performance and is satirized that way by Ben Jonson or Moliere and so on. Uh, but in a broader sense, every craft we learn or we attempt to master inevitably involves our engagement with another, with the capital O. My favorite instance of that is uh, 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 boxing, a sport I took up uh, in early middle age, let's call it, and now practice avidly. And the point of boxing, I never box against someone. I've never actually had a prize fight. I've never actually been blow to blow with someone. But every single move you learn in boxing is in relation to an imaginary other who's about to clobber you, right? So you throw a left jab and then you slip even though no one is throwing a punch at you because that's essential to your imagination of the sequence. The craft of boxing is only not just um, used, but is only possible to imagine when we think of it in terms of an engagement with uh, uh, another human being. Um, finally, let me mention something that occurred to me as you were talking, which is, of course, that uh, post-antiquity, uh, post-Plato, uh, 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 of course, we think of Jesus as a craftsman in the first instance, as a tecton. Uh, Jesus is a carpenter, as it's usually translated, though I'm told by people with more expertise than I, that it means more generally craftsman, artisan. Um, and it's fascinating to think about why Jesus would be described as a craftsman or artisan. And what struck me as I was listening just now is that it, there's something, yes, there's an idea of integrity built into our idea of craft. There's also a democratic ideal built, built into our idea of craft, not just that anybody who pursues a craft with sufficient passion and perseverance should be able to learn it or master it in a way that we don't associate, say, with the wild muse and inspiration of poetry, but also that its role is to be widely disseminated. That's one of the ways in which I think we distinguish an excellent craftsman or carpenter from uh, a decorative artist, one of the ways we distinguish uh, Fabergé from uh, William Morris. And there is, in the description of Jesus as a craftsman in that way, an implicit democracy of effect that I think is also part of what it is that we value in the mystery of craft. Perhaps one way of saying it is that art builds museum and craft builds churches. Anyway, thank you very much. Thank you, Adam. Uh, were philosophers rulers, or rulers philosophers, Rachana Kamtakar would also have by now played herself in a major motion picture. <laughs> but as things stand, she is instead professor of philosophy and classics at Cornell University. Although not bearing outright rulership, she does have great authority in the field, not least as editor of the acclaimed Oxford Studies in Ancient Philosophy. And I have personal reason to know that she wields this power with great judgment and real humanity. Professor Kamtakar's specialty is ancient theories of moral psychology, especially Plato's, and she often works at the juncture of ethics, motivation, action, and or practical reason. But she has also written careful and creative studies on Plato on race, and whether we can even call it that, Aristotle on slavery, agreement and law in Plato's politics, Plato on art and education, Plato's feminism, the Stoics on emotion, and other topics and authors, such as Empedocles, Euripides, Epictetus, and Seneca. She has been and is uh, recently, currently, working on ancient arguments about determinism, agency, and responsibility. And it's a great pleasure to have such an insightful reader and clear expositor with us to discuss today's rich set of topics.
Thank you. And it's such an honor to be able to comment on Rachel's amazing work um, in, these, in these lectures. Um, OK, so um, I hope that what I'm about to say doesn't uh, bring this wonderful discussion back to the desiccated things that uh, in ancient philosophy that uh, King Kirkstra talked about at the beginning. But I'm going to start with um, Plato's Statesman, which is a dialogue that pursues a definition of the craft of politics. Um, and in that dialogue, the main speaker flags a basic mistake that we commonly make about political leadership, which is to model it on the figure of a shepherd. Homer's epithet for king is shepherd of the people. This is a mistake because whereas sheep herders are superior enough to their flocks that they can take care of the sheep's every need, human political leaders share in nature and nurture with their subjects. And as a result, subjects have to take care of their own economic needs. The upshot is that the political craft is restricted to the coordination and, and the harmonizing of individually insufficient but collectively sufficient human beings who can be expert in one or another craft while needing the products of others' crafts. The reason we make this mistake and confuse the political craft with the total care that herding provides is that we once lived in an age of Cronus under the care of gods who addressed our every need but when Cronus let go of the helm of the cosmos and the gods ceased to be in charge of our rearing, we needed to take care of ourselves. That's when Prometheus, Hephaestus, and the other gods gave us fire and the crafts. So I began with this story because I believe that it captures Plato's basic attitude to the crafts as necessary or deficiency compensating given the current human condition rather than as intrinsically valuable in a way that is celebrated by Auden in the poem that Rachel began with. Some scholars have concluded that Plato values crafts only instrumentally, and so to the extent that he models virtue on craft, values virtue only in instrumentally. Now, rather than argue about whether and how Plato models virtue on craft. Rachel's brilliant lecture challenges the merely instrumental conception of craft itself, sharply distinguishing the imperatives that come from a craft on the one hand and our motivations for taking up, sticking with, and acting on a craft on the other hand. Craft's imperatives are, as she puts it, motivationally insulated. Rachel's distinction is fundamental to our understanding of both craft and Plato. However, I believe that the distinction that she's drawn should be separated out from another idea that Rachel combines with it. And this is the idea that craft is by nature aimed at an impersonally or disinterestedly good end or telos, which is, I think, the ultimate source of normativity on her vision of craft. I think this could be a very good idea, but I don't think it's Plato's idea. So in a nutshell, I'm going to be um, arguing in these comments that Plato believes the end of a craft must be one thing. It needn't be one good thing. Rachel argues for her teleological conception of craft against three other conceptions that as she puts it, see in craft a kind of pure instrumentality, a source of, un, of undirected and ethically neutral power. And she raises really powerful considerations against a merely instrumentalist conception of craft. But I think that Plato's conception of craft is more inclusive than hers, and the difference suggests another source of normativity than the good end that a craft might produce. For Plato first, not all crafts are productive or practical. The mathematical crafts, for instance, are crafts, but they're not productive, and they're defined by their subject matter. In the Republic I discussion that she draws on, the expert accountant, the logistikos, specializes in calculation. In the Gorgias, another craft-focused dialogue I'll have more to say about in a minute, the craft of arithmetic is about odd and even numbers, the craft of astronomy about the motions of the stars, sun, and moon, and their relative velocities, and so on. Second point, even if we restrict ourselves to the practical crafts, 
Plato, at least sometimes, includes among crafts activities which bring about something that is either not good at all, or at least not disinterestedly good. Among the crafts of acquisition, he counts piracy, enslavement, tyranny, and warcraft. Third, against Thrasymachus's selfish conception of craft, what Socrates says is, and I put this on a slide, um, He says, no knowledge, episteme, seeks or orders the advantage of the stronger, but rather the advantage of the weaker and that which is ruled by it. This contrasts the deficiency of the object of a productive craft with the sufficiency of the craft created to remedy that deficiency. It's because our bodies have many deficiencies that the craft of medicine was developed to provide what is advantageous to them. So the reason the craftsman qua craftsman doesn't aim to benefit himself is logical, not ethical. The craft is by definition non-deficient, at least in the respect in which it was able to benefit its object. And being non-deficient, it can't be benefited or improved in that respect. For example, medicine is the power to produce health in the sick body. Medicine can't be made healthy itself because it's not that sort of thing. Rachel may reply that this argument is just ad hominem against Thrasymachus, and it doesn't affect her deeper point that according to Plato, crafts cannot be ethically neutral. So I want to zoom out from the argument of Republic One and ask, why think that it's criterial for a craft that it be good directed, not just formally directed at some end, some unified end, but directed at an objectively good and disinterestedly good end? So I suspect that in the background lies a discussion in Plato's Gorgias, which distinguishes between knowledge-based crafts and experience-based knacks in some translations, which I'll follow, um, or pseudo-crafts. In a passage that expresses the core contrast, Socrates says, and I made a very literal translation for you here, um, flattery, perceiving, I don't say knowing, but guessing, the four true crafts, having divided itself and submerged itself under each of the parts, pretends to be whatever it has gone under and cares nothing for the best, but always hunts after folly and deceives it by means of what is most pleasant, with the result that it seems to be of the greatest value. Cookery, this is making relishes to put your bread in, cookery has submerged itself under medicine and pretends to know the best food and drink for the body, with the result that if the cook and the doctor should have to compete among children, or among men as foolish as children, as to which of the two knows the best and worst foods, the doctor would die by starvation. I call this flattery because it guesses at the pleasant without the best. I deny that it is craft, but say that it is a knack, because it has no account of the nature of whatever things it applies to the things to which it applies them, with the result that it isn't able to state the cause of each. So my last slide um, just summarizes Socrates' distinction, and um, you can just have that before you as I, as I um, uh, continue. So you might take the knack here to be a pseudo-craft that is practiced by the con men trying to pass off their fakes, pleasant experiences, as the real goods. But the contrast Socrates draws is between what cookery and medicine know versus guess at, good as opposed to bad food, the means by which the product health, which medicine knows and cookery doesn't know, is produced. And hence, what they're able to produce, health versus an appearance of being or becoming healthy. So it's not as if the chef is saying, let me be your doctor. To be sure, Socrates says that each kind of flattery has submerged itself under a genuine craft that cares for the body or soul with cookery pretending to be medicine. But it's the pseudo craft or knack, not as human practitioners, that's doing the pretending. And I think it's pretending is just, it just consists in appearing indistinguishably to non-experts. It's the children who vote up the chef. What's deficient about the knacks or pseudo-crafts begins with the fact that their products are not one thing. What's pleasing to the body or apparently health-producing or apparently health-restoring will depend 
not only on variable bodily conditions, but also on variable experiences and perspectives and expectations, which frame the present experience as pleasant or not, or apparently healthy or not. But if the product isn't a single thing, there won't be a single production process for producing it. And so there can't be any single account of the cause what pleasure production applies and to what in order to produce pleasure. To produce pleasure in a particular taster, the chef must, must either guess based on experience of many tasters or else inhabit the taster's soul. Being the object only of a knack is thus a necessary characterization of a non-unified product, not a contingent one that depends on the competence or character of the procedure. So in distinguishing true crafts and knacks, Plato does not contrast expert with non-expert production of the same thing, but two kinds of product, one unified and so craft producible and the other not. I think that the unity of subject matter requirement for craft not only accommodates the non-productive crafts, but also explains why Plato suggests that subordinating a pseudo craft or knack like cookery to the rule of or um, use by a real craft like gymnastics or medicine can turn it into a serviceable craft. This is because health is one thing and being health conducive is a property by which some subset of the many ways of being a gustatory pleasure can be unified and given a single account. The unified subject matter account of craft also explains some of the items on Rachel's checklist for craft, why the craft involves knowledge, why the craft is teachable and learnable, and thereby intergenerational, and why the craft's techniques are coherent. But you might be thinking, can crafts be normative just in virtue of having a unified subject matter? Rachel's given us good reasons to doubt it, but Plato seems to think yes for crafts considered qua knowledge. Qua knowledge, the crafts have standards of precision or truth unmixed with ignorance. The carp so carpentry is more precise than pottery because carpentry uses measurement. And geometry is more precise than carpentry because bodily things are less amenable to precise measurement than the quantities themselves. On this view, what issues imperatives is the knowledge for example, geometry's imperatives might include rules for what is prior in proofs. Geometry says, take as principle and definition of a triangle three-sided plane figure, not figure whose internal angles add up to two right angles, even though those are coextensional. Take the second, geometry says, to follow from the first. Geometry's imperatives might also include standards of precision for, for um, incommensurables and so on. These don't seem to depend on a telos, much less a good telos. So I wish that Rachel hadn't opted to say as little as possible about knowledge, since I think that the norms that seem to me to derive from knowledge are both compelling and mysterious. To draw her out, I'm gonna close with a question about a sort of productive craft imperative that seems to me to derive from knowledge, but knowledge about materials rather than telos. So the sort of imperatives I have in mind are, don't cut more leather than you need to make the shoe, use the leftover leather to make shoelaces, or when you're breaking eggs, collect the egg white that adheres to the eggshells instead of letting it go waste. These imperatives distinguish craft production from mass production. In mass production, um, either the production is insensitive to waste, or if sensitive to it, then it seems to be for reasons of economy or morality that are foreign to the productive goal. By contrast, craftspeople seem to respect their materials. And it seems to me that somehow this is because craftspeople know their materials and know, in particular, the material's potential. And this isn't just a matter of scarce resources. In a game of chess, that checkmate is craftier, which takes fewer moves and kills fewer of the opponent's pieces. Plato describes this aspect of craft in his account of the creation of the natural world, which he conceives as the work of a divine craftsman and his workshop of apprentice gods. So for example, after the creation of earth, air, water, and fire, the gods use some of the leftover fire in the design of the eye so that 
animals can see, especially human animals can see. Like the leather conserving shoemaker, the gods are repurposing the byproducts of a previous making to make something good. But I don't actually understand how such craft imperatives relate to the telos of making the best world. Would our eyes be worse at seeing if the gods hadn't used the leftover fire? Or would a world in which the leftover fire was not used for anything be a worse world? It seems to me that what we marvel at in craft is not only the excellent product, but still more the ingeniousness of craft in using the potential of materials and, and, and processes. So we marvel not only at the shoe that is most fit for protecting the feet when walking and the selection of the materials best suited to that end, like leather for flexibility, durability, and lightness, but also the shoe that's made of materials less well suited to the end of walking, like the clogs that are made from wood. And partly what we admire or marvel at is the, difficult, um, the difficulty overcome in getting the material to achieve the end. But if that's right, I'd like to know, is this another source of normativity other than the telos, or does it somehow derive from the telos? So I'm looking forward to Rachel's replies. Thanks. Thanks, Rachel. So I'm going to uh, invite Professor Barney to um, reply very briefly uh, so that we can also get to a few questions, but we want to give her a first occasion, having been invited to say more. Well, thank you. That um, was all fascinating, and I especially enjoyed the moments of unexpected convergence. It's clear that uh, my two commentators could write a joint paper on Top Chef American style, Japanese style, and in Plato's Gorgias, and the three uh, different models for choosing who the best chef is. Um, so there are some big issues raised that I want to postpone till Friday because I really want to discuss them properly. And um, in particular, Adam Gopnik's point about how crafts change and the dynamism, the unpredictability, and looking at craft art interactions as a way of thinking about that, that's a whole huge tangle that I, I hope we can spend some time on on Friday. I don't want to try to get to it now. Um, and in relation to Rajna's comments, the whole question of uh, how theoretical and practical crafts are related, because she's absolutely right. I didn't have time to talk about this, but for Plato, mathematics is also a techne. Um, and he is not interested in the practical theoretical divide that becomes so important from Aristotle on. And that should be somehow worked into um, the discussion as well. Um, I want to engage a little bit more with what um, Rajna said, um, just to sort of fix in, in your brains what we agree and disagree about when it comes to, to Plato. Um, she is absolutely right that techne gets used very broadly, um, both in Greek generally and in Plato, when he's doing things like uh, listing um, different techni at the start of the uh, statesman or the sophist. He'll stick an EK ending on uh, pretty much anything. Um, and uh, so indeed will Aristotle. Uh, and the measure of that actually is that uh, Aristotle uh, goes on endlessly about politike, um, where it seems like the word to be understood must be techne, the political art, but it absolutely cannot be an art by his own definition of what an art is. But he just, you know, EK endings are a way of picking out um, effortful activities that people seem to value. Um, so I agree that with her that there's a very broad usage of techne and techne-ish terms in Plato. Uh, I don't think that shows that for him the end of a craft doesn't need to be anything good. Uh, I think he is um, very strongly committed to that. And um, I don't rely on the Gorgias so much for thinking that. I'm relying on Republic One itself, where he talks about each art having an idiophilia, a, a characteristic benefit, and actually using that to individuate um, what those crafts are and taking it as, as basically obvious and something Thrasymachus has to agree with, as indeed he does. Um, now, I suspect this means we're going to have a discussion on Friday about why that isn't good enough to, to settle the question. But anyway, that's where I'm, where, where I'm basing myself on. Um, and as for the fact that um, the passage that uh, Rajna showed about 
how um, medicine itself is not defective and therefore can't be attending to its own advantage in its activities and must be attending to the advantage of the thing that it works upon. Yes, um, that is uh, very important for my view and um, I don't really see how it uh, tells against it. I wanna say that yes, indeed, uh, the orientation of craft uh, to the benefit it provides is a matter of logic rather than um, the um, you know, ethical standards of the craftsperson. It's baked right in, and that's sort of the root cause of what, um, what gets interesting about craft um, in terms of normativity. So I think I, I should probably leave it at that. Oh, one last thing which... Um, Adam Gopnik raised, which we probably won't come back to, but um, I find fascinating, is this business of the Gretzky question. Um, because uh, what I find fascinating about that is not so much that the plumber would know who the Gretzky of plumbing is, although I'm kind of interested to <laughs> find out who this person is, um, but the fact that that mode of thought is so easy. And it makes me think something that I was tempted to put in the talk but didn't quite have the nerve, but you, you'll get it now, which is that, um, in some ways, I think our folk concept of big craft is really, it's like the, the map of the London Underground or something with all these interchanges. And it's as if the concept is a ticket, it's your oyster card to get, you know, all the way from accounting to ballet dancing to tennis to medicine. Um, and it's really, it's as if the, the concept is structured as um, just a system for building analogies. Because when I was um, researching this, I, I you know, I learned a lot about wonderful crafts that I couldn't find a way to work into the final text. Um, ask me about Polynesian navigation on Friday, please, um, and film editing. And um, what struck me is that when you read the great practitioners talk about their craft, they always sort of explain their greatest moment in terms of some other craft. So the, the editor says, oh, I feel like a dancer. And the dancer says, oh, I'm like a surgeon. And the surgeon says, well, you know, I felt like... Um, and it's as if there's something very kind of cognitively fundamental about this ability to conceive yourself as doing this thing that you've done, seen done with incredible elegance way over in some other uh, field. So that's one reason that I thought that the paper hanger was so important was precisely because he had Joe DiMaggio at the top of his mind as he was uh, doing his thing. And I think that is one of the, the principal uses of the, the concept for us. So I'll, I'll leave it at that. Okay, these three craftsmen have brought it in right on time, exactly. And so we have 15 minutes for questions, which we never have on the first day. I'll recognize uh, questioners from here, and I'll uh, have, uh, invite any of the three of you to take a swing at the, the, at the question as it comes in. You just press the button on your mic and, and then turn it off at the end. Um, first, Johan. Oh, the mic is coming your direction. Uh, thank you so much. I thought that was a simply marvelous lecture. Um, so, uh, like Roshana, I was struck by something that you said in fleshing out the platonic conception of craft. You said the real end of any craft is always a disinterested good. Its benefit is to society, not to the craftsperson herself, right? So that's meant to explain why the doctor, in practicing medicine for the sake of healing her patient, is exercising a craft. But if I play the stock market with the end of enriching myself, even with great skill, um, I don't, don't count as um, um, exercising a craft. But it seemed to me uh, that this juxtaposition between engaging in an activity for personal benefit uh, and engaging, engaging it for the benefit of society, it leaves out an important third uh, possibility. Uh, many paradigmatic crafts are exercised in the context of fiduciary relationships, where the skilled craftsman is acting on behalf and for the benefit of a specific other person, their client, their customer, um, or patient, uh, not for society at large. So for example, the skilled uh, defense attorney seems to be practicing a craft, but what they aim at, at least directly, is not a just outcome to the trial. They're trying to mount the very best defense they can of their client, and they should do so no less vigorously, even if they privately believe that this person is probably guilty and deserves to go to prison. Or to take another of your examples, the skilled accountant may help you to minimize your tax liability, even if that means depriving 
the polity of much needed funds. So I draw two lessons from these examples. Um, first, it seems to me that many crafts are exercised in circumstances that are inherently competitive or adversarial. And secondly, uh, the good that many crafts aim at is not necessarily the shared good of all, but could be you know, the private good of some individual. So if all of that is right, I do wonder whether that doesn't complicate Plato's uh, insistence that money making could not be considered a craft. Um, it suggests that um, even if investing my money for my private enrichment uh, should not be considered a craft, uh, what about you know, being the fund man manager of Berkeley's endowment or the man manager of a public pension fund or indeed you know, a private wealth manager who skillfully and responsibly stewards the, um, the, the money of their client is trying to make a profit for that client, not because that's what's uh, going to be personally enriching to them, but in their capacity as a fiduciary agent acting on their behalf. Yeah. Is, this, is this working? Thanks. Okay. Um, thanks, that's a, that's a great question. Um, the defense attorney is a very interesting case, and as you probably know, there's a whole, uh, I mean, the, the sort of closest existing area of philosophy to the stuff I'm talking about is probably role ethics right. in, in contemporary philosophy. And there's a huge literature on the ethics of being a defense attorney. And I was not trying to contribute directly to that. Um, I do, uh, in one of the more empirical bits I had to cut, I tried to develop uh, an idea of what I call a multi-craft, which is a craft to which many different crafts contribute and collaborate, and the model would be a restaurant, say, or a theatrical production. Mm -hmm. And I think you could see a trial as the same kind of multi-craft where, um, sure, the, the roles are adversarial, but in a sense, that's, I'm not sure that isn't a trivial feature, really. Everyone's practicing their craft, and the whole is a good thing. Um, so that's the way I'd try to go with that. Um, the trickier case is the stock market case. And again, as I was saying in response to Rachna, um, this is not meant to be a moralistic account of craft. It's meant to be looking at sort of the logic of the agency, the structure of the thing itself. Um, so it's not that, you know, ooh, wage earning, not, not good enough. But maybe if you did it for someone else, that would, that sounds some kind of Victorian pious um, uh, sentiment there. That's, that's not supposed to be the point at all. Um, so then the question is, well, what about, um, what's wrong with wage earning as a craft? And we weren't able to get into this, but I think um, in the long run, uh, Socrates and Plato do not actually mean us to accept wage earning as a craft. That's a bit of a decoy to addle Thrasymachus for the moment. Why can't it be a craft? Um, not because it benefits me, that's not the direct argument anyway, um, but because it um, isn't differentiated in the right way from the other crafts. And there's also, there's a further argument in uh, Republic One, which I didn't have time to uh, discuss, but which I think is actually the most interesting of all of them, and it connects to stuff in later Plato, which is uh, about the role of measurement in craft. And Plato seems to think, I mean, if you want Plato's kind of deep account of the structure of a craft, a craft is something that identifies the correct measure of something. That's kind of the deepest formal characterization that he thinks is a part of every craft. That's, that's what craft cognition is. It's cognition of the right measure. So what the doctor does, what the well, tennis player, it's not his example. But um, every, everyone performing a craft is somehow getting the right amount, um, often temporal, the kairos. Um, what's wrong with um, the stock market then, no matter whose behalf you're doing it on, is um, to do it as a craftsperson, you'd actually have to be, you'd have to try to be making the right amount of money, not the most money, the right amount, whatever that might be. And you actually get that thought worked out um, in at the end of the Republic and in Stoicism um, that, you know, um, anyway, I'm not going to forget I said that, I can't get into it here, mm -hmm. but um, insofar as what people are doing in the capitalist marketplace as employees and employers and people playing the stock market, Insofar as that's a maximizing activity, that has the wrong formal structure to be a craft. May, may I just add that I would much rather have a crafty accountant than a virtuous accountant, <laughs> and I would far rather have a crafty accountant than an arty accountant. <laughs> <laughs> and you probably want a maximizing accountant. Yes, exactly, <laughs> exactly. Okay, a second question back right here. <clears throat> 
Hi there. Thank you so much for this wonderful talk. Um, first, as to the Wayne Gretzky of plumbing, I would submit um, <coughs> Clooney Brown of the uh, film of the same name, directed by Ernst Lubitsch, a consummate yes. plumber. Yes, um, indeed. <laughs> My question has to do with, um, Rachel, one of your criticisms of the Thrasymachus conception. You say that because it views all crafts as ultimately oriented towards self-interest, it, like the bivalent conception, can't meaningfully organize the set of techniques that go into a craft under a common umbrella um, because all of those techniques ultimately go towards the same end. At least that's what I took you to be saying. Yeah. Wouldn't the same issue emerge um, for your view, which sees all crafts as oriented towards the common good? Um, how do crafts, on your view, have um, goals which are truly intrinsic to them as crafts, rather than ultimately say all crafts being subsumed under the multi-craft that is politics? Um, thanks, that's, that's a good question. Um, I do, what, what you said at the end um, uh, was very sneaky um, because <laughs> you, you sort of shifted your question into something that I, I want to agree with, which is that, yes, there's this multi-craft of politics under which all the crafts are, are subsumed. But I don't think that that sort of threatens them with a loss of identity the way uh, the Thrasymachian model does. So again, um, this is not a moralistic conception. And the thought is not that the shoemaker um, you know, gets to the workshop and raises the shutters and thinks, you know, now, how can I pursue the human good mm -hmm. today um, through my vehicle of, of shoemaking? Um, no, you start with the shoes and with the shoemaking techniques and the shoemaking materials. And, um, you know, it might be actually that making shoes is not the best thing for a human being to be doing that day. There might be some moral emergency and maybe the shoemaker should be out in the streets and, um, uh, so it's it's meant uh, it's meant to be a model on which um, the crafts are kind of their own little norm giving worlds, and this this will be more clear um, tomorrow. Actually, that's exactly what I want to talk about. And um, higher considerations have to kind of break in from outside, and it can be very hard to say how and under what situations and so on that should happen. Um, but it is meant to be a model on which. Um, I mean, the common good, that's, that's a, sort of a postulate way over there that all these things at least had better not conflict with. Um, but the shoemaker doesn't have to have a theory um, about that, about how the common good figures in. Um, they just have to think about the shoes. Whereas with Thrasymachus, um, I feel it's really unclear, I think, on his model um, whether we should even, like, what's, what's even the conceptual power of a term like doctor or navigator? Um, you're just you're just maximizing your income on any given day, um, or maximizing your power over other people. Maybe you use this tool, maybe you use that tool, um, but there's a sort of loss of salience of the distinctive features of the craft itself. Can I just throw in quickly? I love your instance of Lubitsch as an as an example of that. And if you think about it at all, the great classic American comedy in Lubitsch to Preston Sturgis comes out of treating crime as craft. Right, You have something that's criminal that does not work for the common good in any way, but it's dramatized as a craft. And we delight in that, because that's what every caper movie uses that. But Trouble in Paradise or um, uh, well, any Preston Sturgis movie involves turning crime into craft. And we recognize that it's both wonderfully appropriate and completely, in, in, in these terms, completely off, off balance. Another question? Uh, thanks so much for a terrific uh, first lecture and uh, wonderful comments. I, gu I guess I just want to, um, this is an invitation to say more about how, how we think of sports as illustrating some of the, um, the craft features that you've been highlighting. Uh, and I'm struck in particular, I mean, uh, how, how, to, how to apply the teleological model to it. I mean, one feature of this is that the, the goal that immediately organizes the different skills is to pick up on something Adam was saying. It's kind of arbitrary. 
and you know it's it's in one one from a certain standpoint in relation to which human agency is sort of meaningless, right? So it seems like it's disconnected pretty radically from human good in itself. Now I I take it your model allows for cases where you know what the human good is some more complicated thing and you're playing your role in a in a social process that's oriented to the human good, but I. I'm curious to hear more about what the human good would be in this case. I mean, the most natural candidate, it seems to me, is something like achievement. Uh, but that, you know, that that doesn't seem like the good that so, you know, that the, the, you know, the the larger activity is socially organized around. It's the good that's achieved by the individuals who are particularly good at the the, the sport that they're participating in. Uh, the other aspect of it that didn't seem to quite fit um, the sports model was the idea of reliable correctness. Um, maybe this connects to the vertebral dimension of it, which seems to me may, maybe to push more in the direction of art than craft. But if we are admiring Patrick Mahomes once again, you know, pulling off a remarkable play, you know, the reaction isn't, oh, he got he he did the right thing, you know, or he got the correct uh, solution to the problem. It, you know, it was a kind of creative, he did something remarkable relative to the goal, but but you know. And he's reliably skilled at doing something remarkable in difficult situations. But the, the notion of correctness seems um, you know, inadequate maybe to the creative dimension of, of, of the activity. Thanks. Um, yeah, I think, you've, uh, I think you answered your own question there um, okay. towards <laughs> the end, which is, uh, yeah, that's what I'm calling verticality. Yeah. And um, I think you can find that in lots of crafts as well as in sports where, yeah, correctness is. You know. and, and this actually comes up in Adam Gopnik's book where you point out that, boy, there are a lot of people out there who you know, play wonderful music in bars or you know, are teaching drawing or something that... Um, craft it's, excellence is incredible. Uh, yes, exactly. Craft excellence is, is not even that rare. And so we, we actually need more words for those, for those higher reaches, I think, than we have. Um, so I'm, I'm perfectly good with that. Um, I mean, one of the great limitations um, to my um, theoretical account here is I don't actually know anything about sports, so <laughs> I'm very amenable to you know every, you all telling me how how these things work. But um, I do. I mean, I said that there was something weird about sports, and you've identified the weird thing, which is, um, and I, I highly commend a book by the Canadian philosopher Bernard Suits about this called The Grasshopper. Um, some of you are, are nodding in delight. This is one of the most entertaining works of 20th century philosophy. And it's all about, it's a philosophical dialogue between a grasshopper and his friends uh, about um, games, including sports, and the metaphysics of them. And I think it's a, it's a very good philosophical analysis. But anyway, the basic point is that um, in sports, what you might call the internal end at which the player is aiming is not the same thing as the benefit produced by the craft. That, you know, I mean, putting my favorite example is, you know, having arrows stuck in targets, that's not a better state of the world, right? That's, it's not that the point of archery is to bring about that improved state of the world. Um, no, somehow the doing of it is itself the, the benefit, sort of whatever it is, kind of sits on top of, of the practice itself but rather than being related to the result it produces. So that makes it very unlike medicine, say, where what the doctor is aiming at is health and the benefit that medicine produces is also health. There's a metaphysical um, discontinuity there. Uh, I don't find that particularly problematic. And for my account or the account I'm attributing to Plato to work, all we have to say is um, that the practice is beneficial in some way. Um, figuring out what the benefit is gets very tricky because certainly if you look at the amateur practice of a sport, well, one person's doing it to have fun, another person's doing it to get fit, another... It's, it's very diffuse. There doesn't seem to be any one thing. It's a, it's a place where many interests and aims meet. And I ducked that problem by saying, well, I'm not going to talk about <laughs> amateur sports. <laughs> and with professional sports, um, then we're, we're kind of in the realm of sociological analysis. And I gave you my favorite candidate, which is, well, actually, the pleasure of the spectator and beauty. That's an important social good. And it leads to other important social goods. Um, so I think the, the really tough residual problem for me is then the problem of what to say about the amateur case. And maybe I'll come up with something by Friday. <laughs> 
Okay, we're out of time, so it remains for me to just do two things. One is to encourage you all to come back tomorrow at this time and Friday for a full discussion. And um, the second is to uh, have you, ask you to join me in thanking Rachel Barney, Adam Goffman, and Rachel.